Yeah. Yeah. Old power. Okay. So yeah, today we're going to talk about command line interfaces in the year of our Lord, 2019. Uh, basically, yeah, and they call it face facts. So here we go. Basically, the shell, also known as the console, the terminal, the command line interface. And according to Wikipedia, some people call it the command language interpreter. But some people doesn't line up to CLI, so we're here to talk about CLI. You know that saying that probably we could be able to debunk if I look it up, but like Eskimos have like, you know, 50 words for snow, and it's because there's so much snow, and then they get a lot of snow. And, and so, so there's a trickiness to that, and I think the same goes for programmers and shells. For whatever reason, we have like five different words for this thing that we use, uh, and we don't like to talk about all that much, right? But it's, very important technology. So I'm going to start you out with all the history, but not like all things, because that could be a very long discussion. But check out this syntax. You know you can do this. If there's one thing you want to on the slide, you can, this is a real command run on history, and then like do it on a pipe, and in parens, you do head, semicolon, tail, and it'll show you just the top and just the bottom. I didn't know that was a thing, but now you do. All right. So, Bit of history for you. The Unix 1, the chip in 1969, came with the shell. It was like sort of a human interface to the strand operating system. But again, an earlier influence from PTSS, which came out of MIT in like 1965, and had this little thing called RunCom for run commands. And that's why all of our files, when you're struggling to remember the bash profile or bash RC, right? You'll be thinking about how well, that RC came from RunCon in 1965. It goes way back, way back. And then the topics finally got around to standardizing it in 1992. Do you know why it's called POSIX? So it was going to be called an IEEE-X, but then Richard Stallman interceded on all of our behalves. I was like, that's not really pronounceable. We should just keep calling it POSIX. So it's safe pronounceable, but IEEE standard. 1003.2, based on some V, actually standardized the shell in 1992. And we still use it today. But why, right? Haven't you heard of the browser, the notebook, the IDE, all this stuff, right? Shells are old. Use something new. You know? We don't have to say that, but like, you know, we question these things from time to time. So I had two main thoughts as to why we actually use the shells so much. One, is that it's a REPL. It's got a very powerful semantic. I don't have to explain to a room full of Python programmers that we have read, evaluate, print, loop, do it all over again. That's something very powerful. You have something interactive, but then you can copy and paste and turn it into a program that you can run as a batch. You know? So it's your, you've got an interactivity that builds into automation. And also, consistency. It's very reliable. The shell is always there. From the biggest, like, enterprise operating system to the tiniest little, like, you know, container image somewhere, it's going to have some form of weird shell thing. Now, but, but basically the shell is kind of omnipresent, and it never changes, and it never breaks. So the command line is mature, dependable, and standard in theory. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, we'll come back to that in a bit. So, second chapter here, Python. How did, let's go ahead and since it's all of those things, let's build on them, right? Then, oh, okay, I'll, I'll teach you a bit of syntax here. So if you're running a Python program and it starts like Python and then you're gonna run a .py file, which is like what you do in the script type setting, uh, you can do dash mpdb and it wraps the whole thing in the debugger so if an exception get, gets raised, it'll drop you into a debugging prompt for that exception. Yeah. A PDB really, if you haven't seen PDB, like, I remember the day I learned about PDB, you know, and it really changed my programming experience. It brought interactivity to something which was previously just sort of a run from end to end black box program. And you'd like, have to put my prints in there. Closer to like to do things that way still. He has a popular stack overflow answer to that effect. But I like PDB. Python debugger. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, Python has several batteries included if you want to build a command line application. Uh, you know, shout out if you've heard of GetOpt. Okay, so only only old hats like you know experienced programmers remember GetOpt. 
It's Python's Python first module for parsing the command line uh, argument. Then there was opt-parse, which was a little bit more friendly and higher level than get opt. And then there was arc parse. All three of them still work. Remarkably, opt parse, despite being superseded by arc parse in 2.7, is still there in Python 3. So you can still use all three of them in Python 3. Kind of confusing, but there it is. So uh, Python has this arc parse thing, and 50 plus CLIs that I've written later, right? I actually had a bit of an awakening, right? And I started to feel friction once I had this awakening. Because I've been using arc parts for so long, I'm like, well, you know, the shell is standard. Arc part probably encodes some of the positive standards deep within it. And there's a wonderful black box. I don't need to worry about the details and it works well, and I'm just going to keep using it. Then I went and started completely unrelatedly implementing a library that did URLs. Now, now URLs, URLs are for sure standard. standard. There's like, like tens of thousands of words written standardized URLs. And when I went to URLs, Lo and behold, I start finding gaps in the standard, right? Even something which was so standardized wasn't a standard at all, and there were creative liberties that various libraries took on how to interpret what you do with a particular query character and so forth. And this was the end of the wedge that started like, this art parse, art parse, like, you know, uh, frustration building inside of me. He's got it. Pirates definitely use. Well, that would be R. Oh. R. Come on, come on. Okay. Uh, all right. So I'm going to enumerate for you a few things that maybe you won't be able to unsee about R. Uh Okay. So who here has ever tried writing uh, a command line application with subcommands? We've all used them. But who's that? Okay, okay, a few. Right? right? If you've used Git, yes. If you use ZFS, if you use kubectl, you know, these things all have subcommands, and these are very large applications, actually, right? Like, I don't need to tell you how much it has changed things to programmers, and uh, it doesn't do so by being a quaint little, like, you know, Unix program that does one thing well. It does a bunch of things mediocre. Give it credit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyways, it has subcommands, and that's what lets it scale. Right? It's a tree of functionality. And uh, that is increasingly the case on the command line. Despite us being in the year of 2019, 2020, the future, right? We're going to be using, we were using shells 50 years ago, and we're probably going to be using them in the future the way things are going, right? 50 years from now, the shell programs are still going to be a thing, so we might as well start getting CLIs right now. And that starts with these subcommands, because that's how you scale a CLI. Here's how you do a subcommand in our course. This is like the most basic version that sounds still lying around my code. Okay? okay. So when you, you make a parser, parser, you tell that parser that you want to add subparsers. Then you add a parser to that subparser handle, which you can then do like normal argument addition to. And then this is a really important line that it took me a few years to realize. You can also use the set defaults method to uh, pass non-argument type stuff through the R first parser onto later parts of your program. This is a very common convention for basically doing subcommands in R parts. You'll find it in places like Conda, uh, if you've ever used the Anaconda distribution. This is what your official documentation. And if you read that far down that huge document, you will probably find it. That didn't happen for me the first couple of years of the R parts. So, um, but yeah. And it's even the type of plugin system if you if you like set it up just so. But that's, that's one of the problems with arc parse. I'm gonna come, come back, back to what that generates in a second. This is what really started chafing for me. By default, default, any unambiguous prefix of a flag is silently treated as equivalent to that flag in arc parse. This is the default behavior. Right? So let me paint you a scenario here. I have a fetcher. It goes fetch LTY dash dash output format, fetch it in MP4 format. Yeah? Later, someone's like, well, you know, I want to put it in a different directory. I want to call the file name something else. Okay, cool. I'm going to go ahead and add this output flag, right? Now, somebody 
accidentally wrote output one time, and output MP4 was there. And how do we all do cash? Just control R. I don't bother to agree. I think it's just control R. Whatever I type last, probably the work then will probably work now. Now, R part has expanded your API so that when I go to actually implement a dash dash output path, all of a sudden that is control R runs out now it saves their thing as the default format in MP4 as the file we called MP4. And if it had been part of the script, it would have just run in a loop, overwriting the display fetch, writing to MP4, run it overnight, wake up in the morning, the ETL pipeline is broken, welcome to like, you know, real life. I use that reason to the dark parse. What's happening? This isn't this doesn't show up in your help string, by the way, that it automatically generates for you. It's part of your API without you realizing it. And you can use the right now. Anything that's the hard part, go run dash dash hell. <laughs> You'll be there. <laughs> now it's, I mean, it's a splinter underneath your fingernail. You can't unsee dash dash hell working. Okay. Now, a third thing, this is a very long list, but it's a short talk, so. R parts, more R than parse, right? So our parse acts like it's a parser, but it's not, it does things that a parser usually doesn't. Can you imagine um, basically if you're writing a grammar and your grammar thing never told you about ambiguous grammar, right? Like, hey, these two keywords here, the thing that like, the normal parser generator does for you. So for instance, you're allowed to have a positional argument as a non subcommand. Now imagine you have a command like git at remote or get remote at, I always mix those up. Get remote at, right? Now imagine if get remote also took positional arguments. Like, what if you had a file or something called add? It would be very ambiguous. Are you referring to the file add right there, or are you referring to the add subcommit? You know? So that's ambiguous. Our first didn't do that. So it, create, it allows you to create an API which is kind of Abusive to your user, or maybe negative towards your user. In control program flow, can you imagine yeah. having a JSON parser, for instance, which, when it didn't like what it saw, it just called sysexit for you? Because that's, that's what our part does. <laughs> it just calls oh, sysexit. It doesn't give you an exception that you can catch that would also exit the program normally. It just calls sysexit. It doesn't give you a structured error. Normal parsers will tell you. This row is wrong. This column is wrong. I expected to see this token. You know, that's what the parser does. That's what you want to have a parser. Our parse is more R than parser. So, really, I started realizing that if it's trying to control program flow, it's not really a parser, or it's actually more of a framework. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about. I always found it weird. The date command will tell you the date, but it will also set the date, like just change your hardware dates. Isn't that, isn't that kind of weird? Anyways, but that will set your, your 2019. It probably is going do that, though. OK. okay. So, so these days, you can solve some hardware parts alternatives. Uh, uh, anyone heard of uh, G flags? Yes. Yeah, yeah, G flags. <laughs> anyway, it's up there. That's what Google uses, and they use it for C++, and Python, and it acts sort of the same way, and it's like one file in Python off that somebody ripped off Google code and copied to GitHub, but it works. So, so it does have one cool thing in it, that actually, like, there's a thing called a flag file, and this is just a file that has flags on every single line, and you can use it like miniature configuration. And it actually scales up impressively well. I have some reference up to my files, and that's how Google computers a lot of its services, turns out. It doesn't, doesn't have sub or anything. All of those files. So, you didn't want that. G-flags. There was a thing called Google Fire, which is really popular. I figured Google allowed that thing to be open source just to like mess with Amazon's SEO. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways. Now, one thing that people like about Fire is you just throw a function at it or a class and it generates a CLI for you. It makes all of these educated guesses about what you want a CLI to look like. And it's a one thing and it generates you a CLI app. So it's got minimal signature, but it's focused on this prototype thing. Like you wouldn't just let that Google code run loose 
fast and loose with your class using your class public API as though we're like a real, you know, command line stack. And finally, click. Any click fans here? Yeah? So click is from the makers of Flask. Flask fans here? Okay, people, some people like Flask. Um, we all run for Tango at some time or another. <laughs> Anyways, so with click, it's a very interesting observation, which I think I sort of made in parallel, which is that a command line application is not too different from a web application. It's just that you're only handling one request, the one that is done by the SSRP. So click was inspired by the you know, web framework and the Flask, and it's like, like both Pro and the Con, brings a lot of sort of Flask architectural baggage. So that's a separate talk. I can talk about how it inverts like the app route like, relationship. So that's a sub API in my humble opinion. So basically, my slides are out of order, but I wrote an alternative, <laughs> and it's used by Simple Legal's uh, key management system called Pocket Protector. I presented on it in the past. It's also used by Glom, a library of medium reviews, which you may have seen at last PyCon talk, um, and uh, Chert, which is a static site generator used to make the zero per and calver websites. If you've seen calver that work, calendar version is probably also the future. Uh, also, also montage is one thing that I'm going to demo to you real quick here. But that's used to judge all of Wikiloves documents, uh, like photography submissions. Anyways, it'll be used by people other than me, especially once I upload the freshly written docs to read the docs. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you for handing me this way. G slides. Okay. Yes. So before we look at some code, what are some features? So taking from those inspirations is that simple composable commands with routing. It's just as easy as writing a Flask site, even easier. I wouldn't bother if it was only as easy as Flask, because that's what it's for. It has a fumable help output. This was a real challenge for me, because basically HTML, we take this for granted, but HTML sort of this is white space and does all these nice things. When you're dealing with managing your own white space, it's kind of tricky to get things wrap and line up correctly and give a feeling output. It has automatic flag injection. I'm going to show you how that works in a second. Um, it has middleware, like a middleware pop-up. So, for instance, if a bunch of commands require you to log in and authenticate before you don't need to add that logic to every single you know, endpoint in your uh, set of commands. Organization. You have a parser layer. So if you don't want to like, control flow stuff, you can get a normal parser out of it. It'll just raise a structured exception and tell you that there's a problem with that, and you can handle it on your own if you want to manage your own control flow. And then it also has PyFile support. This actually generated a bug in um, Python's uh, core uh, library, which I'm in the process of like, fixing. Anyways, oh, it's going to be yeah. Okay. So, here is what a face command looks like. This is actually the command that I use to chop up recordings of Peninsula videos and upload them uh, to YouTube. Uh, it's called cut mp4. Okay, so basically, you tell it to add some flags, and then you also tell it that the main entry point for this command, this one doesn't have subcommands, is this function down here. Input, output, start, and, and no align keyframes are all arguments that will basically be injected into that if it's run, when it's run. Um, it has a really minimalized like, signature. I'll just give you an example to illustrate. I don't say help, which is both a keyword and uh, one character longer than doc. So, so like, I just try to scrunch all the characters out of this and have a really nice API. Another, Another aspect that I'll always bug me about hard parts is you can tell something is required equals false, but you don't specify what the default is. And if I give it the default, it doesn't necessarily mean required equals false. I have to specify both required equals false and what the default is. So instead with base, you just say missing equals blah. If it's if it's missing equals that, that's what's going to flow through. And if it's missing equals error, it's going to raise an exception. So it's sort of like scrunch the API down, everything. Uh, nicer. If you have more characters, you can write more docs. That's what I found. 
Here's some other things to talk about. Like, here I was going to come back to why arg parse and sub commands. It calls them positional arguments. So this is the help generated for church before the face migration. And here is the help for church after the face migration. And I call them what they are, some sub commands. That's what the default help output calls them. I also call flags flags instead of optional arguments. Um, I don't know who thinks dash h as an optional argument in their command. If you want to overload how this stuff is done in our cars, prepare to inherit a bunch of stuff and then have to override underscore methods all over the place. That's our parse is a themable help output. Furthermore, you'll notice it lists every single sub command that you can have in this line and this line. When you start dealing with 20 plus sub commands, you're going to feel the pain when you read that help output. Not so in face. Here's an example of montage actually doing that. Um, I don't know if I can just read all of it, don't worry. But basically, uh, the injectable uh, flags thing is like, you specify all the possible flags up front, all of the subcommands just specify their signature up here, and anything that's in it will automatically pull into that endpoint, as well as uh, included in the help output. So the help output for any more text is not going to include any flag because this and it doesn't need it. And, and you don't need that. If you want to get the code, just, just add it right here. If this command doesn't support the code mode, like leave, leave it out. It will automatically get dropped from the help out. So, yeah. And there's like sort of the help for that admin thing. thing. Pretty, Pretty clean. clean. It still it's does the wrapping thing that some people like in our course, which always is on it. thinks it's 80 characters. Despite, like, regardless of what size I know you got. All right. So what's next for faith? Like, this is all well and fine, but really, like, art parts is built in. Why do you have to even install a thing? I wrote a thing in art parts not too long ago. I poured it to face the week after. But, uh, you know, why face, really? I'm, I've got an ambitious goal here, right? By 2020, I want... Python to be the clear leader in CLI applications. All right? Like, for all of us, it probably already is, right? But CLI apps, I, I, I postulate, are going to be around for a very long time. The new ones are going to be written in 2020, 2030, and 2040. I'll probably, let's hope I'm alive so you can, like, you know, tell me I'm wrong then. But uh, I want Python to be there for all of those. But to do so, we need to solve two major problems. The first is startup time. Base Python itself has a start of time of about 40 milliseconds. Has anyone ever used read write? Okay, so it's like it's like grep, but way faster because it's like Rust it has way better flags for programmers. So you say dash tty and it only looks at Python files. So it's tycs, it doesn't do all that stuff. So that thing runs in like four milliseconds. It doesn't just start up in 40 milliseconds. It runs the whole program. As you build a more and more complicated command line application, such as Conda, you're looking at 200 milliseconds startup time. Now, these are programmers we're talking about here. They're going to be wanting to like run git status like obsessively, you know? <laughs> LS, LS, LS. I already saw it two seconds ago. I forgot LS, right? So, startup time is like a really big thing for us. But Python's base startup time is 40 milliseconds. Start adding some libraries. We're at 100. Start writing your own application. Logic, you're at 200 milliseconds. It's like we're back in CGI land. Anyone here running a CGI web application? Yeah, yeah. What happened? What, what did they do to fix it? Fast CGI. How does fast CGI work? I'm talking about pre formers. You might think I'm crazy. No, you think I'm crazy. <laughs> but why not, right? Like, if I just have basically a little Unix socket sitting in a doc file in your home directory, right? Like, under and, and then there are a few workers that are waiting. You got Graham. I'm not Chrome, I'm not Slack, right? <laughs> I'm just going to have those libraries pre imported and waiting at that run call. So, like, maybe you didn't appreciate this, right? But, like, our parts, you have to handle your own argument. And that's not the case with uh, this down here. You run cmd.run. If you run cmd.run, you hand over control flow. Like, this. 
This is just basically to be sitting on a socket, pre-forked, ready to go. So it's pre-warmed up workers, throw a little shape there that just knows how to kick over those parts of the, this RGB over to the workers, and you can look at sub-rust, like startup times, break the shim and rust, sub-millisecond, like command line. It's going to be so snappy. It's going to have a great time. Okay. So what's the, what's the other goal? Can anyone guess what the other goal is? What's the other thing that Python needs to fix in order to beat the world of the command line? Actually, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. So basically, the information the I'm going to push the boundary between web and CLI app, app right? I think like was realizing that the architecture of our application is not that different from a command line application. And I think we should take this a step further, have a CLI app workers, right? Okay. So we've got to think the packaging distribution thing. I'm not saying build it in, but there just needs to be a default thing that knows how to make a pack, that knows how to make a shiv, just how to make a whatever, right? And, you know, for people that only need a few, uh, like, you know, libraries that are Python and so forth, it's not going to take that much. No, it's not going to take that much. James, I'm going to do Windows support. Anyways, <laughs> but, uh, but if there's a way to do that, like, we need to get back to the same thing as Docker. The story goes, the Docker originally started in Python, but they didn't know how to distribute it. And if you've seen how Docker works, it shouldn't surprise you that they didn't figure out how to package Python applications. So, <laughs> so they switched to Go, and there's all this talk about, well, Go is a system language, and it's faster and so forth. But I'm 99% sure that if you had already gotten the ball rolling on Python, and there's a really clear packaging solution, and our time was an issue, Docker would be written in Python right now, and we'd have to bear the sheeple stone. So, <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I think I went a little bit longer than expected, but at the same time, I, you know, the slides just got finished. Sorry about that. Okay, but yeah, that's space for you. That's sort of like, you know, the ambitious goal. If that interests you, come on by because I'm too busy porting my art parse things to face to actually, like, you know, really push the envelope quite yet. But soon. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, our parse has uh, like an like a epilogue and a, maybe a, of a, a prelog thing. Yes. So, we can put it, does uh, face have that sort of thing? Absolutely it does. In fact, uh, so the question was does um, face have a uh, prologue and epilogue effectively, like, you know, uh, preface and epilogue or something like that? that. It, it has, has a way of that. When I said it has help themes, right? Yeah, I see it. I've come up with a amazing. I don't have to do my horn and notes, but like, whew. I'll just look at it, because it, it always throws me nuts, because you could do, like, a prologue, a prologue, epilogue, and then, but it could have the default arguments, but you couldn't have both. Right, uh, right, right. No, no, no. It doesn't have those problems, right? I've been, I've written, I've seriously written, like, at least 50, like, art parts applications before I even realized I was writing applications, and when I actually started looking at what I expect from my web framework, what I expect from my argument framework, yeah. Uh, like the command line framework, I saw that there was a huge delta. And interestingly, Python has like, it's got to have like 40 web frameworks or something like that. But like the command line uh, landscape is still pretty open. Do you have defaults? So there's defaults, definitely. I mean, I pull in doc strings of functions as the, uh, like, you know, sort of individual line, individual line, like, you have this, like, and I do a lot of these same defaults to minimize the amount you have to write. You know, like, we're competing with Google Fire here where you just give it a random object and it turns it into a command line thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so Do I do wrapping right? I, I think so. Oh, oh, text wrapping. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I definitely wrap it in the same way art wraps it. Now, I have basically a design document where I've gone around and I'm designing a design system. And I'm like, ooh, it should have these various things. I only have the one the hard parse style theme now. And I actually should say, uh, it's just lower than my application. I just need, like, hard parse stuff as well as my terminal with my other main characters. Yes. Um, I, I, will, I will let it go. So, in the default configuration, I will not wrap until around 120 characters. I found that letting it go even wider on even a very wide terminal screen, like negatively affects the readability. And so I kind of like, I think default wrap it at 120 or 140, but it's overridable. Themes, I got themes. <laughs>
Yeah, it, it, it's overridable, and you don't have to inherit from anything to override it either. Important loop. You know, I, I feel like it never did, honestly. Like, I saw it trying to do that in its source code, but I never really saw it actually work. I figured it always was 80, but apparently like, it was trying to read an environment variable. Found the stack example answer that that environment variable is not actually a really accessible thing on most systems. So, like, but I think maybe it's two and three, but no. The time. I'm in an image. Absolutely. Any other questions? Any other questions about it? Thank you. Thank you.